Almost everyone is down. Some of you stand upstairs. Okay, great. Uh, a warm, warm welcome to Vin Group. Uh, my name is Caroline Krenzler, and I'm one of the founders of this startup platform and uh, a group of fantastic many specialist companies. Uh, and of course, warm welcome to our Trap Lunch, or as we say in English, Vin Explore. Much more exotic, isn't it? Okay, today we have full house, as you see, which is fantastic. And we have an absolute brilliant speaker today. Uh, she is both professor at Chalmers in Digital Transformations. She is professor at Thunder School and in Stockholm in NBA. She's been consultant at McKinsey. She's a surfer. Yeah. <laughs> and last but not least, she's an entrepreneur in Portugal. Yes. So, a warm welcome to Robin Teglan. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're testing the mic. Yeah, I think it's working now. Yeah, it sounds good. You can hear, right? Yeah. So, I do this in English. All okay? Yeah, wow, fantastic to see all of you here. Incredible. It's so exciting. Carolyn has been trying to say, you have to come and do this. I said, yes, I will, I will. And I'm so happy to be here now. Um, I just put this up. This gives you a bit of an idea of what interests me. Um, I'm just curious, how many of you use something like TweetDeck? This is a great way for me to like keep up with different technologies. I'm very fascinated by all different kinds of technologies. Fascinated by the ocean, fascinated by robots, etc. So I just show this, I like to have this up in the beginning, just as a way to kind of get people into the mode, right? What are we going to be talking about today? So I'm at Chalmers, um, and I moved from Stockholm School of Economics because I wanted to be in Gothenburg. I wanted to be close to technology in terms of the hard stuff, right? Um, I, in Stockholm, uh, at Stockholm School of Economics, it's in, I, we wrote reports on unicorns and looked into the, what's happening in Stockholm, which is fascinating, right? There's all the, the soft, it's games, right? And then fine FinTech, we have a book on FinTech. Uh, so there's a lot of going on there in the soft. But I feel, where are we going now? It's really into the hard, right? It's the convergence of all different technologies, merging the hard with the soft. And I think if there's a place to be, it's Gothenburg. Because you're smack in the middle. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I'm very happy to be here. No, but seriously, uh, I really am. I think it's, and I think it's also about building networks. I mean, I had been in Stockholm. I, I moved to Sweden in 92 uh, to work for McKinsey in Stockholm and then started my PhD there. Uh, but had been there for, I felt, too long. Now, it's, it's, you need to move, right? I kept telling everybody else, get out of your comfort zone, move, move, right? And so finally I did it. So, But it wasn't until Chalmers actually called me up and said, hey, we have this new professorship, are you interested? I said, yeah, wow, fantastic, getting near the technology. So here I am, uh, fantastic to be here, thank you so much. My research is very much all about uh, networks. Uh, really trying to understand the flows of different resources through networks and how value is created through networks. Now, I'm from this department of strategy and marketing at Stockholm School of Economics. And strategy is about you know, value creation, competitive advantage, primarily at the firm level. But what I'm interested in is where, is where are we going in terms of value creation in society? What's happening outside the boundaries of the firm? Think how life has changed and how we have access to all different types of technologies and knowledge, et cetera, just at our fingertips now. How will that change the way we think and live and work? So that's going to be what I'm going to be talking about today. I put this up here. I came this morning from my course. I'm doing a pitch for my course. Because uh, we're very much, I have 110 third year students in the industrial economics program at Chalmers. They just started this course, Leading in a Digital World. And I try to get them out of the classroom and into real live problems. So they're working with the city of Gothenburg. And the whole idea is we have this challenge. Uh, and they are to come up with a digital innovation that's based on open data, because there's so much data out there. I asked the students, how many of you have worked with open data? I think one kind of did something like this. And so how many of you worked with like digital tools and developing a new inno you know, and innovations? Like maybe, yeah, I think I did something in high school. So I think we have to, as universities, too, change the way we're thinking, get people out there solving real problems, working on live cases. Think about all those hours people spend in their classroom writing exams. What value does that create for society? 
So one of the things we're doing is we're doing this challenge called the Gothenburg Smart City Challenge, and the idea is to come up with innovations to help Gothenburg become a smarter city. So hopefully, uh, well, I, I, there will be in just a couple months, they're actually going to be doing a Eurovision for 20 different teams and they're pitching, they have to pitch their innovation. So there'll be videos, there's going to be a poster ex exhibition and a jury to choose the challenge. So I'm just doing a little pitch. Uh, and this is I put on SlideShare, so any of you can go in and if you want to learn more, if you want to help out. This morning in the classroom I said, there's no reason to reinvent the wheel, right? There's probably a great innovation out there somewhere else in another city. Maybe you could bring it here. Maybe you could even work with a startup here or a company in Gothenburg. Work together to develop this. I didn't say you had to do it by yourself. So I think it's a, this is for me, I'm trying to teach the students too in terms of, you know, thinking about moving from being a, a problem solver to a solution finder, right? Because now we have access to all types of solutions out there. It's about how do we actually use our networks to find them, to go from being a problem solver. So I also show this to you because I put up all my presentations here. Um, and you feel free to go in and download them. Steal with pride, right? You see something you like, take it, use it. Most of it I've taken from somebody else anyway, right? <laughs> I mean, where does innovation and where does all knowledge come from? We're building on the shoulders of others, using others, bringing things together, creating something new. So if you see something, feel free, grab it. And it's also in PowerPoint form, uh, so you can actually look in the notes section. There's links, maybe more information. And some might be like, what is this? That doesn't make any sense, probably because I copied and pasted and for the slide or something and forgot to change the notes. But anyway, you'll find all this. So this is a little bit what I'm going to be talking about. Does anybody speak Portuguese? All right, what, is that, what does that say? <laughs> yeah, yes, and exactly. And the next one, the next line? Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of an ocean of opportunity, exploring digitalization. Uh, I'll get back to that, because I'll talk to you a little bit about what I'm doing uh, in Portugal. This is my first, first presentation in Portuguese uh, for local fishermen. So anyway, if anybody's interested in seeing this in, in Portuguese, you're welcome to go in as that as well. So let's start. Um, I'll talk about another, I don't know, 35 minutes, 40 minutes, and then we can open up for questions. But feel free to ask me in the meantime, too, if there's something you want you know, raise, raise up that hand. It's more fun if it's interactive. So I talk about this as this industrial revolution. That was actually the subject of my lecture today. How many of you watched some of the films or the videos from last week from Davos and the World Economic Forum? Quite a few. There was a really good one. Did any see it, see it with Klaus Schwab and the, and the CEO of Google talking about quantum technology, quantum computing? And AI. It's about 30 minutes long. It was a great kind of wrap up, very interesting to see it from this Google CEO's perspective. But I talk about that because World Economic Forum is they're the ones who are talking a lot about these industrial revolutions and where are we going, which where are we in, in society and history. I think it's important to put things into perspective. Why am I standing here talking about digitalization? Why am I talking about digital transformation? So we'll talk about that. Um, I also just have up there my robot uh, spark. Was anybody at 24-7 yesterday in what's it, Ulkruken or whatever it's called? Fitness 24-7. Uh, Sparky was a, a PT yesterday, my robot. It was uh, the push-up challenge. So uh, in case anybody is uh, in, you know, in the PT industry, it's interesting to see how robots and what, what they can and can't do. The reason I show that is I think it's important to explore and experiment, right? To, to test yourself, to try new things, to what happens if I, you know, this technology, it's very hard to understand it unless you actually put your hands on it yourself, to really test it. So I, I went out and bought one of these, and my kids were so excited. I was like, oh, great, Mom, we don't have to walk the dog anymore. <laughs> we don't have to unload the dishwasher. I said, no, oh, we're not quite that far yet. But we're getting there. So, what am I really trying to do? I am not your typical researcher, I don't think. Um, and the sense of I have written many articles, I had to, uh, to become professor. But I'm very much more interested in, in trying to see this impact on society and not necessarily just writing articles for articles sake, which are important, but also getting out there and really trying to understand value creation. And to do that, you have to cross many disciplines. So my research is anything from strategy to organization to entrepreneurship to, uh, it just keeps on going, long list of things. 
But really what I'm trying to do is understand this kind of bubble in the middle, this value creation. What's happening? And at the core, is many of it, the drivers are technology, right? All these different, and every day you kind of have to redo this list. There was a, a list that came out from World Economic Forum talking about new emerging technologies and, you know, all kinds of interesting things. It's fascinating to see. What I noticed, though, is there's a difference in focus. Up until now, organizations are talking about emerging, disruptive technologies, exponential technologies technologies like Singularity University talks about. What I saw in this World Economic Forum report did they actually started with the use case. It seems like there's a shift now. The people are understanding now it's not about the technology, which is right, it's about the use. What use, what need do, can we solve? And how can we solve that with technology? Instead of starting with the technology, starting with the needs. And I saw this just, uh, just recently when, they, when I looked at this report. Thinking, this is really all about the needs. It's where you have to start, right? We get all these great technologies, but it's how we as a society, we as individuals, adopt and start using these technologies. And that's the hard thing, right? I mean, 10 years ago, if I'd been here, I would say, yeah, maybe tomorrow when I'm standing in front of you in 10 years, well, will I even be? Maybe it will be in Second Life. How many of you had an avatar in Second Life? I mean, that was like we were going to sell cars were being sold there. We were making things there. Our business was going on, teaching, everything. This is the, and look where we are today, 10 years later. Right? It's so hard to predict. So on the one hand, we have the technology, how we as individuals take it, you know, adopt it. It's very difficult to understand. I think also what's going on, right, is the whole aspect of open source, open source software, open source hardware. What's happening there with intellectual property, with value creation outside of the firm? And I take this up because think of who's, who invented the blockchain? Who came up with the blockchain and Bitcoin originally? We don't know, do we? It was some loose community. Well, there's a lot of conspiracy theories. This came from outer space, a group of aliens, uh, North Koreans, etc. But today, you know, so far, we don't really know. But the interesting point, though, is it's not a hierarchical firm that developed this, right? It didn't come from a central bank or, or from other, say, credit card company or another, some established financial institution. It was created outside the boundaries of a firm. And this, to me, is interesting. What it drives people to work, come together, to work together, to go after a common goal outside the boundaries of the firm. Who said we had to have firms? This is one of the core questions we have in strategy. Why does a firm exist? We haven't had firms forever, either. So I think this is what we're seeing now is many of our assumptions around value creation are being challenged because of all of these things. Finance, this whole aspect of fintech. We have a book on fintech uh, by Rutledge if you're interested to go and take a look at that. This is also very much greasing the wheels of this value creation where suddenly it's become so much easier. So what is all this digital transformation, digitalization, and so on? I think it's a lot of companies that are, are you know, saying, or a lot of researchers and companies, consulting companies are talking about, oh, we have to look at, you know, how fast, what's happening, is there an influence on firms, and there's lots of different studies, but I think people are in general of the same opinion that the life cycle of firms is, is shrinking, there's higher turnover of firms on these lists, so there's something happening in terms of this pace of change. People talk about the pace of change will never be as slow as it is today. And I think there is something about this digital disruption where it's, we're seeing this convergence of technologies coming together. It's not just one or, you know, you've got your smartphone, but it's how are all these different coming together. AI with 3D printing, with robotics, for example. So what do we do about the future? We know there's a high pace of change. The rate of change outside an organization is faster than the pace of change on the inside. Jack Welch said the end is near. How do we make decisions about the future? This is our challenge. Uh, there, Peter Kurzweil from AI Innovation of Sweden, he said, you know, universities are great. They teach you how to think about the past, but they're very poor at helping you think about the future. And this is a challenge when we know what we know about the future is a very little piece. What we know we don't know is a little bit bigger, right? What we don't know we don't even know, we don't even know. <laughs> so how can we make these decisions? Should we enter this market? Should I develop this product? What should I do? How do I, how do I, what, you know? And the, another challenge is the way our brains are wired, as far as I understand. Now, I'm not a, a neuroscientist, but what I've understood is that the place in the brain where we take our decisions about the future is where we store our memories. So it's probably not so hard or, uh, to understand that it's difficult for us to think kind of outside a box and challenge our assumptions, et cetera. 
But this is where we really need to be, building different networks to challenge ourselves. What we know we don't know, the more you get out of your network, the more you get challenged, the more tips, the more signals you get from the periphery. And I'm sure many of you have seen this, but I think this still very much illustrates this slide, right? This is the, the inauguration of the Pope. How many smart mobile phones are in this picture? How many smartphones are there? Yeah, one half stupid, right? When did the smartphone come to the market? 2007, 2008. There are no smartphones in this. This is not that long ago. It's only 15 years. Pretty amazing to think how much has changed in such a short amount of time. So, I mean, who would have known, right? I still think this is really get, drives it home, the fact that this is diffusion of innovation because these individuals in this picture are everything from the early adopters to the laggards, right? So this technology went very fast, but this is the challenge. How do we really know? And if we think about change and the future, this is another challenge we have, right? We tend to overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years and underestimate the change that will occur in the next 10. What is the core driver of this? Why is this? Well, I gave you a little clue, right? I'm a social network researcher. This has to do with our networks. Birds of a feather flock together. Like a bon, like a best, right? We surround ourselves with people who are like ourselves, right? Who have the same worldview, more or less, who have the same behaviors, same values, et cetera. So when we see our, our group around us changing, there, of course, the rest of the world. But there's so many other networks out there, right, that have completely different worldviews. And this is where uh, social network researchers 10 years ago, 12 years ago, when these social networking sites started coming out, said, we better be careful. These sites are going to create filter chambers, or sorry, echo chambers, where we filter off those who are different to ourselves or are challenged. So I encourage all of you, in fact, how many of you use like Facebook on a regular basis? I, I do. How many of you change your default from top stories to most recent? Yeah. Many of you probably didn't even know you could. This is where we all, this aspect of change, we have to be, work active these days, too, to get ourselves out of our networks. So I show this. This is very much why we tend to overestimate. The underestimation is we don't even know what we don't know, right? And it's also diffusion of innovations where it's exponential. I can change my behavior. You change your behavior, and, and you, too. So if two of my friends, right, and then two of their friends, and two of each of those, it becomes this exponential. And you don't see it changing under the surface. And all of a sudden, it explodes. In fact, they're talking about it even being now kind of this shark fin because it can go so fast, this pace of change. But we don't see it because we don't even know what we don't know. So speaking about change, it's not just about technology. It's also very much about business models and building up to industrial revolutions. Because industrial revolutions where not only technology changed, our, you know, our, the way we produce things changes, it's also about business models. This is uh, research by MIT. and. Um, uh, and it's very interesting, there's these great uh, videos on YouTube if you go in and look at Parker and Van Alstyne. Van Alstyne has some very good, uh, short, concise videos explaining this, platform-based business models. Where the idea is this, the, all of these technologies are enabling us to change our business models, business model innovation. Where we've gone from a linear model to this platform. So what they did is they took four, four basic industries, Right, so transportation, uh, overnight, uh, entertainment, de retail, and so it took a, a traditional firm and a newer firm, one that's come on kind of the scene after, right, internet and smartphones, et cetera, et cetera, except for kind of Alibaba there. But the whole idea is that they're both solving the same need. I need to sleep somewhere. I need to get from A to B. They're both solving the same need. They just do it in a completely different way. Right? They're thinking, how can we reassemble resources? How can we reassemble value creation through a network? So creating this ecosystem that is AI-enabled and data, right? It's data-driven. Because what's at the core of these companies? It's all data, data scientists, the algorithms they're writing or pulling off the shelves from where, putting in. This is at the core. But what's interesting is looking at the number of employees. What does this mean about the future of society if we're moving in to, say, these platform-based business models where you have a third party, which, by the way, also might be then even substituted by decentralized autonomous organizations or DAOs as we move forward into blockchain. We don't know what's happening. But the idea is that something fundable in the way we think about industry and value creation is changing. And uh, this was actually, I pulled from a report that Ericsson did quite some time ago 
I thought it summarized quite well. It's not just at the business level, it's also at the industry level you're seeing changes. Where you can think back in time, you have know, large scale producing firms all over the world, multinationals, producing many of the same good, getting down those unit costs, right? To sell through local chains. But now if you have platform-based models, it means that small, medium-sized firms, individuals anywhere in the world, can sell their product or service to anyone in the world. Seven of the 10 most valued companies in terms of market cap are these platform-based firms, two of which are in China. What we're seeing too then is that multi, what about multinationals? The way we think about traditional multinationals, will they continue or maybe there's something else? Because a lot of research is beginning to show that that small, medium-sized family firms are more profitable. So what does the future hold in terms of, of value creation and business models and industry logics? And I like to look at kind of Alibaba as a kind of an example of one firm that's working very much with this data-driven innovation, not just offline, online, but also offline, combining. Thinking ecosystem, what is at the core of an ecosystem? Why do we pull ecosystem from biology? What is at the core? What's kind of it? If you think about all the partners, what is, what is the core of a, an ecosystem? Anybody want to shout it out? It's circular, yeah. And what does that kind of mean? If you, it's, in a way, it's circular. What else? What, what, what are you talking? Yeah, when you say circular. A closed loop, yeah, go ahead. They're making use of each other. They're dependent on one another, right? And in order for to survive or to progress or to, you know, become, to develop, you depend on one another. If I'm going to do well, you have to do well. And I think this in a way, I mean, I'm not, uh, you know, I think it's just about looking at how they're using the technology. Their idea is they have a network of, say, mom and pop stores, so small, small uh, grocery stores on the corner, right? What is Amazon doing? They, they have a different approach. They're trying to kind of automate everything, right? Take away the jobs. Alibaba saying, well, in some sense, saying, well, maybe we could facilitate these small, you know, firms, these small family companies. If we think ecosystem, what are the, what don't they, what are the resources they don't know? What are their needs? Think about if you're, if you own a little store on a corner. What's, what are your needs? Marketing, right. What else? I mean, you've got some answers up here. Now, inventory. How do I even know what those in my local community want to buy? What about pricing? What's by the right price? What about my floor layout? What about accounting? What else? You, if you think about small, medium-sized firms have a lot of challenges to be, profit, to be um, efficient and profitable. So I above it, or in other organizations, they're thinking in this ecosystem, say, okay, how can I solve the needs of those in my ecosystem to enable them to be more profitable and more efficient? Because when they are, then we are. And so they've got different ways where they're trying to work with that. So, for example, they can enable them with, okay, floor layout. Put sensors down on the floor. Ah, this layout you have, it's not so good. Maybe you should rethink the layout of your floor. Or dynamic pricing. Hey, by the way, we know that because we have all this data, that out there, you know, if it's 30 degrees outside, that a price of Coke should cost this much. Maybe you should, you know, change your pricing. Or what about inventory, right? If we know we're seeing a change, we've seen the demographics in your neighborhood have changed a lot. You have lots of small uh, fa or ki families with small kids. Maybe you should rethink your inventory and helping them. So I think I use this as an example to show how you can think in an ecosystem. It's about gathering data about all the individuals or firms or partners in the ecosystem and trying to use this data to solve needs. But they're doing it offline and online. So putting all this into perspective, and why, where are we today? Why are we talking about ecosystems and digital transformation and this Alibaba ecosystem? World Economic Forum, uh, together with, uh, based on the research of, of economic historians, there tends to be a pattern where there's a big innovation 30 to 40 years later. There is a uh, deep global financial crisis. Out of that comes this industrial revolution where basically the way we sustain ourselves, the way we organize value creation, live, work, et cetera, changes radically. Think back prior to the first Industrial Revolution. How, it's not that long ago. It's only a few hundred years, isn't it? How do we live and work and sustain ourselves? Did we leave home and go to work? Do we have a boss? Do we have a timesheet? It's not that long ago. 
We lived in small communities, self-sustaining, very circular too, by the way, probably. Hmm? But interesting, this is not that long ago if you think about how long we've lived here. Then came the, uh, the, the steam, or I'm sorry, yeah, the steam engine, right? And out of that, what happened? Then people started moving to cities. This is when kind of we started getting this distinction between work and our private life. You had to leave home to go to work. You left your, your family life at home and you went to work. You weren't supposed to have, you know, you weren't supposed to be laughing at work, et cetera, et cetera. It's like, it's, it's crazy, huh? But it was about efficiency, right? Because in the first Industrial Revolution, we went over to mechanization. We mechanized production. People moved and started working in factories. Then came the second Industrial Revolution. This is when multinationals came along. When did uh, Atlas Copco, Ericsson, and Huildebank, this are, when, when did these types of organizations, especially the B2B, you can see it here, right? It's really only the 1870, 1880s. How long have we had multinational B2Cs? How long have we had like H&M and Ikea? Is it 100 years? It's not even 100 years after the Second World War. But yet we take it for kind of for granted that this is the way we organize value creation. These multinationals, right, that you know, have their resources spread out, they have their central control of power, and they have their, their subsidiaries. This is the most profitable. But who said it is to stay? So we, you know, about the future moving in, I mean, they're, they're saying we had mechanized first, right? Then we moved into mass production. Then we started automating. And what people say is the third, we're somewhere in the middle of that. Electronics, IT, internet. And what's the fourth all about? Well, this is where as we'll see supposedly much more convergence. We don't know. What will the firms of tomorrow or the value creation organizations look like? Will they be bottom-up, emergent, open-source communities? All this affects society as well, right? I mean, this isn't that long ago in Sweden. In fact, it seems like we're still teaching some of these management techniques. Control, 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 right? And come to the office. Think about Yahoo, right? When, uh, when the CEO got so upset because she looked around and there was nobody in the offices and she said, everybody has to come to the office. But why do you need to come to the office? It's interesting to think about what are happening with jobs too. Because in each industrial revolution, we have a shift in how, you know, how we do our work, how we sustain ourselves. And it's no wonder if you think, yeah, this is a lot of the jobs, but think about what are those people doing? A lot of routine tasks that this can do. Server halls, <laughs> in the cloud, all these tasks. What about urbanization? Maybe we'll see that, oh, urbanization, we go, you know, we're seeing, oh, we're going to keep on going, moving to the cities, moving to the cities, moving to the cities. I question that. I'm not so sure. I'm thinking about maybe local communities instead. Do I want to move to a city? Where are the jobs? Are they, will the jobs be there? So we have this type of work. We also have lights out factories. We even have lights out pizza factories, pizza restaurants. Anybody ordered a pizza from this, uh, I think it was Domino's? Lights out pizza restaurant, everything. You don't talk with the person. There's no human interaction, right? You order it through the app. Uh, the order goes to the robot. The robot fixes your pizza because pizzas are pretty much the same thing over and over again, right? You just put, you know, a little sauce on. You put a little, whatever, sausages into the oven and then into an autonomous vehicle. It drives it home to you. Where are the jobs going? Well, I'm, in every industrial revolution, we create new jobs. And how many of you have heard of the company Automatic? This company has 30% of the world market in content management systems, CMS. How many of you have heard of WordPress? Yeah, interesting how you know WordPress, kind of their major product, but you don't know the company. How many people work for a company that has 30% of the world market? How many employees do you think they have? Something like 800, 900. The rest are volunteers, freelancers, gigsters, small, medium companies that are in this open source community enabling the development of this. What does this mean about value creation? And they have no offices. Their CEO and help management looked around and said, hey, there's nobody in this nice, beautiful office in San Francisco. We're paying an awful lot of rent for that. And they said, well, why don't we give our employees coffee money instead? Pay for them to go have, you know, to buy their coffee at Starbucks or work wherever they want. What about that face-to-face? -face? Do we still need face-to-face? -face? How are these people working? There's something called the half-life of trust. And when we meet, so I, I meet you, right? Uh, I don't know your name. Hi. What's your name, Daniel? 
Yeah, yeah, nice to meet you. So, so we just met, yeah? Now, I, I have a little bit of a feeling of trust. You're here, you know, this is a reputation. I can kind of see, you know, you're here. So, but after time, over a month, I was like, I kind of don't really remember that guy. Can I really trust him? I don't know. But if we met again, we'd get an injection of trust again. So research has shown that if you have like this half-life of trust, that it dies off. And if you can create a, ry a rhythm, like a heartbeat, of getting those injections of face-to-face, so you have a team that meets, say, once a month, and you get that injection, or every six months. Or Automatic does once a year, they bring all their employees together. But then they also say the teams can come together. So they'll, bring, they'll pay for the team to come together for, say, one week. Well, where do they meet? Well, does anybody heard of Outsight? Outsight is a chain of co-working, co-living spaces around the world. So they have one in Lisbon. So I was in the Lisbon one. And I uh, met a few people there. And yeah, they were sure enough there. They were having a team meeting there for one week, bringing everybody together on the team for face-to-face -face intensive working sessions. Oh, but by the way, they could also go out and you know enjoy the nightlife at, in Lisbon. But they also have one in Bali, right? So the team loves to surf. So why don't we go surfing? Or what about skiing in the Alps? It's a chain of co-working, co-living spaces around the world. In fact, the fastest growing office trend today is co-working, right? where you can bring together, and, and, and so outside enables this. So I'm showing this because it's a little bit about showing the you know, different signals from the periphery or where we might be going, because it, it, if we're talking about industrial revolutions and digital transformation, it's not just at the firm level. It's not just you know, this digitalization of a, a process. It's about business model innovation. It's about systemic change at the industry level and even at society level. And I think if we're looking forward and thinking about making strategic decisions, we need to understand too, or at least try to understand, look for what, where might we be going? What scenario do we see in the future? It's about testing your ideas in different scenarios. Do they work in different ones? So I show this one because this is Lisette Molinar. She's in The Hague. Anybody know what's inside her boat? Drugs, yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, not that I know of. You never know. You would think. Yeah, you, you would. Who knows? No. Actually, something quite different. She has a, yeah, it was a great, yeah, it was a great guess. No, she has a 3D printer factory in her boat. She lives on her boat. She's a, a freelancer gigster. She's a mechanical engineer. And she decided she wanted to make her own 3D printer. So she actually has a 3D printer factory in her boat. And she gets all her knowledge. She didn't know how to do this. She just went out online, found a few different communities, reverse engineered. The, the software at the core of these 3D printers is open source. So she started developing her own, building her own. And then parts, oh, well, she could just order them from AliExpress, right, from Alibaba. Comes within a day or so. So here's Lisette, and this really challenges to think, where are we going in terms of even production, right? Materials, as we move into this new world where different things start merging as well. And what about the future of labor? This is a report that just came out where they looked at what might, it was, it was very interesting, they were playing around, what might the future jobs look like? Kind of like the, the robot uh, Personlihets designer. Interesting. What will be the jobs be of the future? Our challenge here is at what pace will these changes come along? How will we as a society transform, et cetera? This is a report you can also download and get lots of information about. But I think what we're seeing, I think, is kind of this transformation where this is the way we tend to think about organizations. But this is where work actually gets done, too. And already today, in today's organization, this is how I started my research. I was fascinated. It was in the 90s, it was like knowledge work, right? And we had knowledge databases, and we were going to have knowledge management. I don't know if any of you remember those days. We were going to get everything out of our heads and put it into a database, and you could come along and take it out and use it. Yeah, right, huh? Yeah, well. That, that, was, that was like you went and spoke to managers and this is what we're doing, right? So I was very curious. So I studied, I did my research on Icon Media Lab. Remember that company in the 90s? Because it was fascinating. They were bringing together many different competences, working in networks, right? Really trying to encourage community and, and online uh, sharing as well. And this very much, I was, became very curious. How are they using these new tools, this email? Right? I sat across the, the desk uh, or a table from a, a CEO of one of Sweden's companies, and he asked me, he said, this was in 96, do you think that internet's going to be around tomorrow? <laughs> this was 96. 
what will we be saying in another 20, 25 years? But I think this is where, if you look, if you compare a formal organization with the informal, right? You ask yourself, what percentage of work gets done, say, even in your own firm, through the formal, where I have somebody else told me who I have to work with or report to or do, versus the informal, where you take your own decisions? Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Passion drives this, right? Master drives this. A 70 to 80 percent in the 90s, research was showing work was done here. Problems were solved, decisions were taken in the informal. The remaining was the 20 to 30 percent in the formal. Where do we tend to focus our, our efforts? It's always on the formal, but this is where work is getting done. Think about now how much access we have to knowledge and communities, et cetera. Do we even you know, need that to the same degree? And some researchers are saying, well, maybe we're down to 5 percent. I'm sorry, 5 percent there, 95 percent there. We don't know. So I think this is a. Fascinating to see, and this is also very much enabling kind of to me, in my mind, moving away from why should I move to a city to work in some, you know, will there be any jobs and all like that. What are, what's the big hit in Delhi? I think it was Delhi. You heard of these oxygen bars? You pay to breathe oxygen because the air is so bad. Do people want to live in cities with, you know, crime and, and crowdedness and pollution? They're showing more and more the, all the air particles, etc. Where will we go? Where will we live? Where does the future hold? Well, maybe we'll be out on land, out in the sea. Seasteading. In Gothenburg, yeah, in Gothenburg, yeah, in Gothenburg. Or out on the sea in old oil platforms. Who knows? So I think it's, uh, I'm going to wrap up with about another 10 minutes where I'd like to show you what I'm doing to help me in my own understanding of this. How can we prepare for this future of many unknowns? as a faster pace of change. So just real quick, we're going to do a sim very simple exercise. Okay? We're going to read one sentence out loud together. OK? You guys ready? See how, how awake you are. Here we go. Opportunities are. Yeah. Isn't that a great? It's such a great little one. But most tend to see nowhere, right? But it could be now here. This is a little bit about our brains and the way we work. We don't necessarily like change. We may even want to change, but it is difficult, right? So opportunities are now here. There's so many opportunities, but it's about finding them, right? And to do that, I think we really have to test ourselves because we don't know what we don't know. So how do we explore? How do we get out there and explore? Well, two years ago, uh, or about, and I'm sorry, it was only a year, and no, it was like, gosh, it was a year ago, not even a year ago. Somebody approached me and said, hey, you want to do something? I was really getting interested in the ocean, and Torsten Linder said, hey, we're going to start an ocean data factory. Do you want to be the director of it? I was like, what, ocean data? I don't know anything about ocean data and AI, and I don't know. Well, what, whatever, whatever. So I jumped in. So I think it's also very much... Today, no, who, how can we know everything? It's impossible. It's about taking on those challenges, looking, taking an opportunity to say, yeah, I can do this. But thinking about you have your network. Everybody has their network, right? Who's in your network who can help you in new roles or looking for opportunities? So I jumped in. So I just show that because this is one of the things that were projects that we're working on. Where one of the, where we just had a use case that was presented two weeks ago where we're predicting the spread of a little bitty shrimp into the Baltic. And this little bitty shrimp eats everything. It destroys ecosystems. So we're using lots of data, and then we're trying to, with the help of machine learning, to predict and wonder what conditions this little shrimp might move in. But the interesting thing is that this whole process we can use also for the spread of toxic algae coming from Japan. So I knew nothing about this, but I just threw myself in. So I think it is very much about exploring. So I'd like you to think about your networks. Who do you think you are? Are you A or B? Both A and B have five relations. Who do you think is more innovative? Who do you think knows more about opportunities? It's impossible to say. You have to look beyond your connections. Who are your connections hooked to? Now, I've dra drawn it out, right? This is about, this is, you know, to Spetson. Now, who is more innovative? Who has more access to opportunities, do you think? Who is more successful? Fascinating to think. Look at this. I mean, this is, a, this is a, an echo chamber, a filter bubble, where everything goes round and round. You get better and better at what you're already doing. But this, you might be doing the wrong thing. You might be doing it right. One could say, you're doing all the things right here. But this is about doing the right things. This is how you learn to do the right thing. You explore. So I used to talk about this, the difference between management and leadership, where management is doing all the things right, 
Leadership is about doing the right things. But it's about enabling your, you know, empowering networks and enabling your networks to help you to explore as well. So I started exploring. I felt a little bit like my world was becoming here. I'd been in Sweden for a long time. I've been in Stockholm. I thought, well, you know, I, I need some inspiration. Sweden is very, you know, at the top of the, all these lists, but is there something else going on out there? So I started surfing, and it took me to Peniche. In fact, I was the, the chair, the, the uh, casseur, the treasurer for the Swedish Surfing Association. I thought, why not? That's, you know, I don't know anybody who surfs in Sweden. That'd be a great way for me to create some new connections. So uh, they said, hey, you want to? I said, yeah, I'd love to. So, so I was, a, it was a very challenging. <laughs> it's probably the most challenging board membership I'll ever have. <laughs> but anyway. So I ended up in Peniche. Has any of you been there? Have any of you been there to Peniche? Yeah. It's about, a, it's an, only an hour northwest. And why does one end up in Peniche, one hour northwest of Lisbon? Well, it's because of surfing primarily, the waves. Great beaches. They have everything from beginner beaches to Super Tubos, which is a world competition in, yeah, this, yeah, in this high, 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 whatever, high challenge uh, surfing. So here, for example, this is over at Super Tubos. Now, when I started surfing, you think, well, what does that have to do? Well, I started exploring. I wanted to know if we're talking about digital transformation, industrial revolutions, what about that digital divide? Who are those people in the photograph at the back? Not those surfing, but who are the ones in the back of the photo? And what are they doing? Who are they? This made me very curious. And the more I learned, I learned that, OK, these are fishermen, small, medium-sized fishermen. Peniche was, just a few decades ago, one of the richest cities in all of Europe because of fish. Now it's one of the poorest. It's one of the seven areas, regions of all of Europe that's the poorest. It has gone that fast. And I think that can tell you a little bit. I compare, I try to, you know, does this, what about in other industries or other regions? Change can happen that fast. So from one of the richest to one of the poorest. The more I learned, well, it's no wonder. It's because 90% of fish stocks are gone. We fished out 90% of what's in the ocean. How? Well, this. This is industrialization. This is globalization, right? Large trawlers coming in, taking everything away, taking up tens of thousands of tons, and off they go. So this, on the one hand, you have the community that's dying. You also have the ocean because of this. We know that the ocean is in a critical state. So this, I started, wow, this, you know, be learning more and more. I knew nothing about this. What percentage of trash in the ocean, waste, is at the, on the ocean floor? Anybody know? That you can't see. You know we have stuff floating right on the surface. It's like five times the size of whatever, France and England and so on. Yeah, it's about one percent up here, six, seven here, and the rest at the bottom. We don't see it. Think of what's that doing to our ecosystem down there. So the more I learned about this, the more I saw, well, I have to start doing something because it's not only, sorry, about the, the, the ocean. It's also about the economic model around coastal communities. There's a, more than a billion people living in coastal communities around the world who's lost their source of living. So they turn to tourism. Well, what happens if we have flieg for bud or, or like this next generation potentially? I had a student from Chalmers come down this past summer. She was so happy. She was working with us. She was so happy on her way home. It only took 55 hours to go home on the bus. <laughs> took 62 down. Now it's only going to take 55. So happy. What does that mean for tourism in these places? So I started being very curious. Think, well, okay, how can we empower these coastal communities? Because if we're talking about moving this digital transformation, industrialization, et cetera, we need to also say that we need to enable new job creation. Where will these new jobs come from? And this is where I've stepped out of my traditional academic role and becoming more of an entrepreneur. So we've started up a company, Ocean Tech Hub, and I'll show you a little bit about what we're doing. To start, we chose Panish because it has so many basic resources. It has tremendous knowledge about the oceans. Think of generations of fishermen. They know how to maneuver boats. They know how to build boats. They know how to fish. They know all about the ocean. At the same time, you have an entrepreneurial spirit because many of these are small, medium-sized. They know how to drive, run their own businesses. You also have a university. In fact, my son, he's 25, he, he, I, when we started talking about this, he said, Mom, you have to do it in a place where there's a university. I said, why? Because it's the new talent. They understand. They see the world differently. And they have spare time. They want to help out. They want to contribute. So we ended up in Peniche and all types of resources. We said, well, we, this is the base, but how can we interweave it with new digital technologies if we're thinking about new jobs and trying to create a new economic model? 
So there's tons of new technologies, everything renewables, robotics, et cetera. So I'll show you one of the first projects we're doing is the Pelodrone. 97% of the fishing fleet in Portugal is small, medium-sized boats. How can they compete against those big ones? So a little bit of like the Alibaba think. How can we enable small-scale, medium-scale fishermen to do their fishing more efficiently? They still have a quota, but today they can spend 8, 12, 16 hours sailing around in the sea looking for fish and not finding. And as there are fewer and fewer fish, it becomes harder and harder. So yeah, traditionally you can say, well, just, you know, we'll make the sonar a little better, the boat a little faster. But let's take a step back and say, could we, what can we do if we were to start over in terms of searching for fish? So this is a Norwegian company, Birdview, and they've created a drone that's AI enabled. So the drone has image processing, image recognition. It goes out and says, ah, it looks like there's some birds over there. There might be fish down there. So then it goes over and then it lets down an echo sounder into the water, which has also been trained, right? So it actually can identify the size of the catch, what the catch is, and whether or not there's any bycatch or whether or not it should be caught. So you get more efficient catches, you don't more environmentally friendly, sustainable, because you don't take fish stocks that are dying, or you know, the, the, you need to take the fish stocks that, that are, what I say, very, that will be, enable sustainable uh, production of the, of the stocks. And you can cut down their set time sailing at sea by around 50%. That's a lot of greenhouse gases that you reduce. And you can fish more sustainably. But the idea then is, well, what can Luis do when he's not, say, fishing fish because they have a quota? What about fishing fishing nets? Could we then think about cleaning up the ocean? So I'll show you a little bit of this model we're working with, and then I'll round off. This drone can also, the echo sounder, you can also train the algorithm to identify trash at the bottom of the sea. So it can actually go out and locate ocean litter. Aha, here's a bunch of ocean nets. So then we can work with the fishermen to pull up those nets. Well, what do we do with them? Well, we have to, first we have to work with the fishermen to repurpose their boats, to enable this. But then, when you pull it up, whoops, on, what do you do with it? Well, there's all types of new technologies out there, right? You have graphene, you have 3D printing. Can we think differently about what we do with these polymers that we extract from the sea? This is a difficult process. This is something that my son is working on right now. And it turns out there's a, there's a company in Italy that is very good at this chemical process to actually recycle and reuse fishing nets. Well, we can do this, but then what do we do with it? Well, what need do you have in coastal communities? Local transportation is horrible because you have like one or two months of the year where you have a peak and the rest of the year you have very few people and you don't have that tax base. Can we not then create 3D print pods, autonomous pods that drive around? Everything I show you exists already. It's about putting it together in a systemic view. And the reason we do this is we want to create a model around entrepreneurship so that these pods would be on the blockchain. So we're working with another Norwegian company, Empower, that already has a blockchain for traceability and a cryptocurrency. So you can trace back the fishing net that, say, is in the, in the pod back to the fishermen. So when a surfer comes to town and wants to take the pod, they pay with the, the local cryptocurrency and the money comes back to the fishermen. Or maybe the elderly woman who owns an Airbnb, she has solar panels on her roof, she can charge the pod so she can go to the doctor for free. It's about thinking differently if we were, if how can we start over in a new model where we put the pieces together. So we've jumped in, personally, financed the, the uh, the purchase of this building, this is a, a fishing, uh, this is Luis Santana's father's uh, fishing warehouse, 100 meters from the beach. We bought it. We're now working with the president of the community, of the municipality, Enrique there, and the city architect to rezone this whole industrial area. So, because today it's only for commercial use, but we want to have digital nomads and bring in people to work on this project. So we need to have co-working, co-living, co-learning. We also bought a project space a cycle, a bicycle workshop. And in there we have people who are working with this process of reusing uh, ocean nets. And we're doing it too. We have one guy, he's actually doing a skate. You see the white uh, pieces there? The idea is that's going to be made out of recycled fishing nets. So if anybody wants to help, you feel free to find, to, to uh, join. Because what we're trying to do, what we're working together with the locals and even the, the Ministry of Portugal now, I, knew, I mean this started a year and a half ago, not even that. And already now working with the Ministry of the Sea, uh, different people, because there is the potential. If we think about 
value creation of the future, new societies. This is a fantastic quality of life. Clean air, you've got uh, fantastic surfing, all types of sports, and you have the future of the, you know, they say this decade is the decade of the ocean, of access to all of these new technologies. And by the way, there's a science and technology park, which we didn't even know when we first chose this place, is going to be built there. Portugal's only marine. I'm going to end off with one example. Networks. You never know who is who. So I wrote a, a, a white paper, you could say, about what we're doing in Peniche. And I put it out. This was in September 2018. Put it on SlideShare. Didn't know who would look at it. At the time when I took this photo, there were 848 views. Well, in October, I get this very strange letter. It's like, dear sirs, I come across your report. You know, not so good English, big star, private office, long name. I'm thinking, is this like some Nigerian thing? <laughs> a little very skeptical. I had no idea who this person was. <laughs> no idea. How many have heard of the name Champelimod? Yeah. It's fascinating. Carolyn's met him. He came to visit. In fact, here's Duarte in the middle there. He came up to visit, and we brought him to see Vingrip. He's, he loves this idea. He wants to, to, to do the same down in Portugal. How many of you have heard of Investor and Wallenberg? This is the equivalent in Portugal. I had no idea. He contacted me out of the blue. And since then, we've, we've developed a, a, a working relationship. And here I am up in Uppsala with some fishing nets from Peniche working with Graphmatech. They want to be the first company in the world that does fishing nets, you know, recycles fishing nets into graphene reinforced 3D printing uh, filament. And so Duarte, in his family industry, they have injection molding and tooling, one of the highest, uh, you know, say, most sophisticated in Portugal. So he took us there uh, about a week and a half ago. And this is one of the key parts of our circle that we started out that we didn't have. And here we are with the CEO and their chief uh, product developer. They're holding in their, their the black things there are this um, graphene reinforced polymer from Graphmatech. And they're looking at, wow, think what we can do, sensors, and then we can use the, graph the, the ocean nets and so on. So who knows? I think it's, for me, it's very much about exploring, seeing where are we going, testing, uh, creating networks. Um, if anybody is interested in, in, in coming along on this journey, we have this Coastal Community Challenge as well coming, where we're people, it's open for people to, sub, to submit their uh, ideas around turning ocean waste uh, into something of utility for coastal communities. Uh, we're, we have a prize to go to Lisbon for a big conference. Um, yeah, and you'll get all this as well. We're also looking for sponsors, if anybody would like to sponsor. In the mean, oh, by the way, Melby Gord has, has said that they would like to sponsor. So, and if anybody would like to learn more about this, this is, we are actually even picked up by Portuguese national TV. There's a documentary where they interview the fishermen and what we're doing. All this happened in such a short amount of time. So I've tried to put a, a, a model on it. I think it's about visioning. Trying to see, not a vision, but visioning, a continuous process of scenario thinking, challenging assumptions, what's out there, testing with your ideas with many people from many different networks. Networks for purpose, yes, okay, I need to build this network because I need access to this resource. But being open, serendipity, by chance, like Duarte, who sends this random email, and I'm thinking, ooh, who is this person? Collective competence. Since you need to bring together so many people from different backgrounds, when you're doing it with people who are like yourself, it's much easier. You have shared language. You have kind of a shared values, et cetera, behaviors. But it's collective competence building, when you bring together people, so it's, you have to really focus on developing even. One word can mean many different things. And then you have to co-create an experiment. We don't have the solution. We don't know what it is. You just have to go out there and do it together and explore. And I think that will enable us then to tackle our global challenges. Because purpose is such a driver. I have so many people volunteering who want to be part of this to help out. So I went over. Um, if anybody's interested here, three books we've produced, uh, are published with Rutledge. They're all open access. We bought the licenses. You can download for free. Uh, Ebooks on digital transformation of labor, fintech, and also digital transformation and, and kind of the welfare state, public services. So feel free to download those. And good luck. <laughs> Come to Portugal and go surfing. Thanks. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Wow, that's really inspirational. Thanks. Thank you very much. And, and, and I'm quite happy that Wing Group is, is really yes. building all these uh, mm -hmm. fundamentals, as yes. you showed. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, questions, please. What are you thinking or about? Reflections, yeah. Or reflections, or anything. Or just... <sighs> This is my son, by the way, up there, who's running everything down in Portugal. He, he uh, dropped out of uh, Rotterdam School of Management after one year, uh, international business program. He said, Mom, I got everything I need. I got my network. What else do I need? Mm. And so he jumped out, and he's, he's self-learning so, and running this. <laughs> okay, I, can I start the questions then? Yeah. Uh, uh, so how would you say the big multinationals should think? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. regarding this? How should they start exploring? Yeah, or how? It's very, yeah, uh, what you're seeing a lot are actually like, I mean, even some are putting people in co-working spaces at the individual level. They're, they're setting up like incubators or like funds, etc. Others are thinking maybe we should break ourselves up. Maybe we shouldn't be so big. With that fast pace of change, how can you have a board that understands all the different industries or the different, you know, new technologies that are coming along. So there's also a, an interesting, you know, what do, what's our core? Somebody asked, you know, they said you should go in and you should say, if we were to fire 80% of our staff, which 20% would be left and what would we be doing? That's really the core. So I think it's also about even questioning what is the, what is the purpose? What are we really doing? And how can we build network? How can we actually not control or own resources but have access to through the network so I think it's hmm. any question yes yeah well I find it super interesting thank Thanks. you Thanks. Uh, I'm I was thinking about whether my network was a or B and it were uh, I have seen some uh, tools yes to to uh, make some sort of analysis of, mm, uh, yeah. of it. But they're very heavy-handed and yeah. they take a lot of time to do. Do you know of any yeah. automated uh, system, some, some good social... Yeah, network, yeah, there yes. is some, yeah, there's some social network visualization. I, it changes so fast, but I can tell you if you go to Wikipedia, there's a long list of different tools. Some are free, some you have to buy, some you program yourself, some you don't. So it depends on your own skill level and your own willingness to pay. Unfortunately, there was one, LinkedIn had one, and they, they closed it down because it had to do with using other people's data or some such thing. And Facebook had it as well. Uh, there is, oh, it's it, it just, there's one. Send me an email. There is one that's, that's free. Uh, open, open, uh, ex, open node, Excel, Excel node, Excel node. So you can download, I think, your own email traffic, your own, and then you can create your own. Uh, and it's an open source one. Yeah, X, Excel node. Thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think it's really good exercise to do. And you can even just start, you know, doing it your, yourself. You know 80% of your network. But it's the 20% you don't know that's interesting. Okay, any more questions? Okay, then uh, thank you thank very, you. very much Thanks. for a thank great lunch. And thank you. Hey. Oh. Hey. When you go surfing, yeah. <laughs> I will come join you next time. You better, you better. <laughs> ah, better. Fantastic. Thanks. Tack för dag. Cool. Allt Thanks. gott. Thank you. This is fantastic. Thank you. Cool. Tack. That was jättekul. Yeah, really? Wow. Fantastic. But I could tell. Ah, tack. It's a UV. Uh, yeah. So I can, I can open them. You have to try them. Yeah. But I should, uh, I should sell these at our surf school. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Hey, thanks. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. This is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it, it might.